Well, thank you. I am uh, delighted to be here. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Sonia. And uh, thanks to the New York Academy of Sciences and the Neuer Foundation for sponsoring our event this evening, Quid Pro Quo, the Ecology of the Self. Can we ever really know ourselves? That's a profound question that philosophers have debated for centuries. Of course, the self is a very elusive subject. And last week when I was uh, talking with our panelists to try to figure out how we were going to focus this discussion, I suggested maybe we should start with a very basic question, just what is the self? And uh, Roy Baumeister very smartly suggested we not start with that question <laughs> because we might all end up looking like idiots uh, as we tried to come up with a succinct answer. And I'm guessing we'll sort of come around and you know, get at that question, but maybe in a slightly roundabout way. The very idea of the self, of what it means to be self-conscious, has a distinct history. On my flight out to New York, I was reading Sarah Bakewell's wonderful new book about the great French essayist, Montaigne. She makes the argument that the idea of writing about oneself to create a mirror in which other people recognize their own history had to be invented. It did not exist forever. And Bakewell believes it was invented in the 16th century by Montaigne, her, the subject of her book. And whether or not that's true, our panelists may want to weigh in with their own opinions. What Montaigne did was write a series of personal essays, 107 in all, in which he questioned himself again and again, and he, he built up a picture of himself. As Bakewell says, a self-portrait in constant motion with various inconsistencies, which has since laid the foundation for the modern sense of self, and I might add today's uh, tell-all memoirs. Now, what's changed in recent decades, I think, is that scientists have also gotten into the act. Psychologists, biologists, and neuroscientists are now exploring a number of profound questions. When do children develop a sense of self? Do we need language for this? And if so, does that mean chimps and elephants do not have an understanding of self? And how does my self interact with other selves to shape my sense of morality? What does all of this have to do with our capacity for empathy? What would it take uh, to create a robot with a sense of self and moral responsibility? Those are a few of the questions that I think we'll dig into tonight. I'm sure we'll give answers to all of these <coughs> questions in uh, the next uh, hour or so. And let me explain our format. We'll talk for about uh, 40 minutes or so. Then we'll open it up to questions from you, from the audience. These are written questions, so you should be thinking about this as we're talking and uh, writing down uh, your suggested questions and then pass them to the ushers and they will hand them to me and we will respond to your questions. And now let me introduce our distinguished panelists and uh, they're actually very distinguished. They've written lots of books and have named professorships and things like that but I'm going to cut to the chase. So just very quickly, uh, Paul Bloom, who is uh, sitting in the center, is a psychologist at Yale University. Owen Flanagan on the far end, a philosopher at Duke University and Roy Baumeister, a psychologist at Florida State University. And, and Owen, maybe because you're the philosopher here, uh, let me start with you. Um, is there really such a thing as a unified self, or is that just a fiction? Um, well, thanks. I, am I projecting fine? Good. So it's interesting you mentioned uh, Montaigne as the um, originator of sort of, uh, you know, the sort of autobiographical self. Because in philosophy, uh, we usually talk about um, Socrates in about 400 BCE. Socrates tells us that we should know ourselves, know thyself. And uh, so, uh, and then usually, again, in my field, we would talk about St. Augustine in the second century as being the first um, autobiography. Uh, so, and the way we philosophers think about this question, and this is where Augustine's is a really nice example, I think we'll connect up with the psychologists. Philosophers usually say this, um, is there a self? Well, it depends on what you mean by the self. Just because there's a word called self in the language doesn't mean there's a thing called self. Uh, the word is, as linguists say, polysemous. It means many different things. But we usually say something like this. For each and every one of us, there's this question. What is it that makes me the same person over time, if anything does? Now, uh, the if anything does, because there are people who think there is no such thing as the self. But here at St. Augustine is kind of interesting because uh, and this goes along with the idea that autobiography had to be invented. He actually has one of these lives that actually is divided into two. So until he's 33 years old, it's kind of animal house. It's sex, drugs, rock and roll. <laughs> and then there's a transformation. Then there's a complete transformation. And he remembers both parts of his story. And so 
the answer to the philosopher's question, what is it that makes someone like Augustine, and maybe it generalizes the same person over time, is something to do with the fact that he possesses autobiographical memory about his whole life. Now then, though, there is the view that, well, what is it that grounds autobiographical memory? And there, there are sort of two major views within the philosophical tradition. One view is the view that's very, very um, common among world religions, East and West, that there's some kind of diamond, a kind of a, a permanent, immutable, singular monadic thingamajig inside each and every one of us that goes with us through life and actually can go on after we die. And that's when, we, when we, our bodies die, decay, and disperse, but perhaps, according to some traditional views, the part of us, which is our essence, goes on. And then, of course, there's a view that's more associated with naturalists like myself, which is that, no, there can't be anything that permanent and immutable. There's something like um, the conscious stream uh, and my ability to remember who I am over time and project myself forward that is what we usually mean when we call the self a self. So on that view, the self is not a permanent thing. It's kind of a, uh, I'm a series of self stages, maybe like St. Augustine. Let, let, Paul Bloom, let me bring you into the discussion. Let me rephrase the question slightly. Um, do you think uh, we have one self, uh, or do we have perhaps multiple selves? It's a good question. I, I honestly don't have a settled view on the self. I hope by the end of tonight to be I hope by the end of tonight to have resolved all these questions to my own satisfaction. Um, but Owen, Owen nicely summarized, I think, the philosophical question, does a self exist? Is a self an illusion? Another option on the table, which might seem crazy, but is getting more and more adherence, is that within each of our heads, there are multiple selves, a community, a government. This is an old idea. Many philosophers have defended it. You could find it in Freud. And you actually find a lot of work by behavioral economists and people who study addiction. So the notion here would be, how do we make sense of something like um, many of us wish to diet? Uh, we wish to eat less, but still we, we eat more than we want to. We want to quit smoking, yet we smoke. We want to not check our email every 30 seconds, yet we do. And we have these battles inside our heads. And one way to construe this is in terms of multiple selves, each with sharing a lot of memory and personality, but each with different goals. And interestingly, at war with one another, um, the self that doesn't want to smoke can try to hide the cigarettes or tell your friends not to give you cigarettes. The self that doesn't want to uh, drink can, um, can, can forcibly can, can commit oneself in various ways not to drink. And there's this internal battle that might suggest there's more than one self inside a single head. Well, uh, Roy Baumeister, let me turn it to you. Uh, one self, multiple selves, does, does, the, does the very the idea, concept of self yeah. have real meaning? The idea of multiple selves surfaces from time to time in self theory, but it, it, it seems always to fizzle out because the very essence of the self is, is sameness. Now, now, there's an important phenomenon here which Paul has called our attention to, which has, is inner conflict. Uh, and yet all these supposed inner selves are really different versions of the same self. You know, it's, it's your cigarettes and, and so on. And, I mean, to get here, I had to get on an airplane, and I had to show them identification. And they said, if I, TSA person had asked me, who am I? And I said, well, there are multiple cells. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I would have been here this evening. So being the same person across time, and you know, you're that. That's it. The other the thing, though, is uh, I think the most recent version of the multiple selves comes from brain work, because the, the brain guys can't seem to find gals can't seem to find one spot and say, well, this is the self. And they're saying, well, maybe it's not there. Maybe it's an illusion. Maybe it's kind of scattered all around in multiple pieces or something. Um, but the brain doesn't need a self. It doesn't need unity for its own operations. It's sort of evolved adding on pieces and, and so on. And it can do lots of other stuff at the same time. To deal with the social environment, you need to have one self because you know, things like ownership is that you know, your pair of shoes and your land and so on, or is that someone else's, their continuity of self matters and, and to conduct relationships and, you know, whose children and... and well, let, let me follow up on that. To, to have a, a, a continuity of self, is this basically about memory? Is this uh, the, sort of based on the idea that we construct stories, we construct a narrative <clears throat> about who we are, and is it take away the memory? Do you take away the self? Well, um, Owen brought up you know, the important point that uh, autobiography seems to create our sense of self as well. Uh, but there is also the argument that uh, 
uh, without self, I can't remember that I did something. I can just remember that somebody did something. So, I mean, I was born in Cleveland. I don't actually remember that, but I'm, so I'm told. But uh, all I could say was somebody was born in Cleveland, uh, which is uh, much less useful, and again, less useful for helping me get on an airplane. Um, so there seems to be a presumption uh, or, or some underlying continuity that has to be there to make memory possible. Well, well, well let, me, let me follow up on that, though. Suppose someone comes down with Alzheimer's. Is that per, who you know, obviously has severe memory problems, is that no longer the same person? There, there's some notion of self, I think, which, which Roy is right, which we need. Yeah. A notion of unitary self we need for moral and social obligation. Uh, say Owen gets drunk afterwards, uh, commits a terrible crime. Um, wakes up in the morning. It's an Irish slur. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, wakes, up, wakes up in the morning um, having no memory of his crime. Still, we would hold him responsible. From it, it would be impossible. So, so there's a notion of self which may or may not have a neurological or psychological reality, but it's socially essential. And, and, it's, and it transcends memory. It follows around our bodies, um, barring some really extreme circumstances. And, and we need it from the standpoint of moral responsibility. Uh, so the person with Alzheimer's still has the same position in society. So again, the external demand on selfhood is still there. The person still has the same name, the same social security number, the same home. Even if the person doesn't realize it, other people will realize it, find the person out wandering around, and drive him or her back. Say, well, this is your home. So again, the, the social environment requires the continuity of self. Owen? The way um, this problem. Um, John Locke in the 1800s uh, talks exactly about these kind of questions. Uh, uh, so Locke's, Locke asked this question that, about what, what it is it that makes a person the same person over time. And his answer is that what makes the same per a person a person is autobiographical memory. And, the, and his idea is that so each and every one of us, according to the Lockean view, if we can construct an autobiography or hold it in our head, um, uh, is that person. He distinguishes person from same man. So granny, in late stage Alzheimer's, who no longer remembers her life, herself, her grandchildren, her, uh, and so on and so forth, she's lost the thread. So according to the Lockean view, we would say of her she's the same homo sapiens, or the same human being, but she's not the same person. And, and Locke's pretty clear that he thinks that, we, that this term, terms like self and personhood are technical terms. He says, Personhood is a forensic narrative, a forensic concept. It's a legal concept. Now, going back to this uh, idea that uh, about the, the drunk Irishman or the granny with Alzheimer's, the um, the idea there would be um, Locke has an answer to that, but it's given by his uh, uh, the dominant theory. It's that on Judgment Day, God plays the role of correcting all your memories, so that if you do what all us normal humans do, forget, engage in a lot of self-serving. Um, uh, uh, narrativity. Uh, none of us think that autobiographies are accurate reports, fully accurate, and these are something that psychologists can talk about. But we spin them. But luckily for Locke, on Judgment Day, he says, God reveals the secrets of all souls. Now, we don't have that view among maybe scientists, and, but I think the social community does play the role that uh, my colleagues here were talking about. We do say to people, even if you're amnesic about what you did, you did it. Well, l let me ask the question then from the, the other end of life. We've been talking about people maybe with late stage Alzheimer's. What about the young child? Uh, when, when do children develop a sense of self? Can we actually pinpoint a particular age? But, Paul, I know you've, you've done work on this. Um, I'm very interested in the development of, of babies and young children. It's my, it's my day job. It's what, what I study. Um, and, and, but it's a very hard question you're asking because, like Owen says, a lot depends on what you mean by self. Around the second year of life, um, babies start to show some things, some emotions, which are called self-conscious emotions, like guilt and shame and embarrassment, which seem to be excellent indicators that there's some sort of self going on. But long before that, um, we find in the laboratory, and other laboratories find as well, some degree of moral understanding, some degree of uh, response to the pain of others, judgment of certain acts as positive, others as negative. And one question I'd love to know the answer to, which would speak to, to, to your issue, is can children at this age, babies before their first birthday, judge their own acts as right or wrong? 
and we're trying to figure out a way to study it, and so far we haven't made any progress, but that would speak to the very hard question of how the notion of self emerges. Do you need language to have a sense of self? I mean, it, it, does a child only to start to develop some sense of self once that child has some understanding of language? I would say no. And one reason I would say no is that there are people who grow up to be adolescents, to be adults, who are fully intact cognitively, yet they have no language. These are, for instance, uh, deaf children raised in environments where nobody communicates with them. And, but when you look at their lives and their mental lives, and later on when they come to possess language and they tell you what they have thought, it seems as if this is an extremely rich life. It, seemed to be, it would seem to be bizarre to deny them a sense of self in any sense of the term. So based on these unusual people, I would argue that you don't need language. It sounds like you are making an equation between self and moral accountability. Do the, the two go hand in hand? I think so in two ways. One, one sense would be to hold you morally accountable for something in the past, I think, presupposes that you were the same person who did it. Otherwise, they'd be holding you accountable for something someone else did. That's ridiculous. And a second way, which is, I think, more controversial, and, and, and is that I think to some extent our fundamental moral intuitions and moral judgments, particularly with regard to our own acts, presuppose a sense of self. Roy, do you want to weigh in on this? Well, uh, Paul knows much more than I do about uh, development and so on. I just have to say, almost certainly it's going to be not a continuum, but not a, a single um, break either. It's going to be kind of a step function and will acquire understanding of self in pieces. Uh, and, and so there'll be uh, uh, steps and, and pro progresses. And, and so you can say, at which point is this the self, or which does it qualify? But uh, um, that becomes somewhat arbitrary. Yeah, you, can, you can probably say at what point it's pretty much done and there's a fully uh, fleshed sense of self. Uh, but uh, getting there would be pieces uh, in pieces. And the same would go for uh, talking about other animals. Uh, that uh, you know there might have some bits of it and some uh, elements of it, but to say they do or do not have a self is probably not entirely meaningful or satisfactory. Well, that was going to be my next question about animals. Do do animals have selves? I mean, we know uh, from research that that certain species can recognize themselves in a mirror, for instance. Uh, is that a sign of of some concept of self? seems to me that, I mean, it's an interesting, very interesting discussion because there are the people, of course, um, who do think that a concept of the self presupposes language, and of course, if that's the case, then animals, it's a problem for most other, uh, our, our fellow mammals. I, I do tend to agree with uh, what Paul said about uh, not only the human cases, but it's very hard to explain certain activities of other mammals without thinking that they have memory for episodes. So the, the animal that knows where to go back for water or for food um, has something uh, going on that lo looks to be pretty complex. And uh, so it would seem to me we should presuppose that it has something like um, uh, some kind of memory system that supports its recognition that it has a life. Uh, one thing I just wanted to suggest about what Paul said, though, about um, memory, about um, accountability, there are cases, of course, where this often happens with people who were members of the Weather Underground, say, in the late 60s. Um, who uh, were involved in some kind of uh, anti-war protest where people were killed or bombs went off, and they're caught 30 years later, and the woman is a mother of children in Oregon or whatever. The courts do sometimes find it mitigating if a person says, I am no longer the same person I was then. Um, now, that's an interesting way of using language, and we seem to understand it. And I think it goes like this. It's related to the Augustine situation. He's no longer the same type of guy. Um, he still has the same, he's the same historical being. It would be a little bit like this. If you think of the self as like a baseball team or like a country, if you say like, what makes the New York Yankees still the same New York Yankees that they were when Babe Ruth played for them? At one level you might say, nothing, absolutely nothing. None of the players are the same, the stadium's not the same, the blades of grass aren't the same, the owners aren't the same. But there's this idea that there's some kind of historical threat or the, or the country Germany, actually every country is like this. Uh, the boundaries are different, the people are different, the places are different. So this would be a more, um, the view that I'm just now suggesting would be, the self doesn't have nearly as much unity as we ascribe to it, and we ascribe it a lot of unity because of our moral, and moral practices require it, as it were. Uh, it may not be, um, another way to think about this is, I, Owen, feel a lot like the same guy I was 10 years ago. 
but I feel very remote from the guy I was when I was 13, although I remember a lot of stuff about that guy. I feel very, very remote. I feel about, I feel more like Paul, who I've known for a long time. I feel much more like this guy, Paul, than I do like a relation of that guy that I was when I was 13 or 23. Can I something here, though? If self is what you mean when you say I, I notice you're saying, I am not the same person that I was when I was 13 uh, or 30 years ago when I bombed the... Uh, we philosophers star that I. We have mutations that we do this. Okay, I didn't know the star. It, it's silent. We know how to do that. We know how to do this. We just need a whiteboard. Okay, well, that's <laughs> well, let me, let me follow up on the question of animals and their sense of self and animal morality uh, because there have been some remarkable stories, and it's often more anecdotal than systematic, about um, uh, chimpanzees that act, uh, act uh, empathetically. Uh, that, uh, I mean, there's the story of the, was it the gorilla in the zoo, a Brookfield Zoo? The, there was the child who fell in and... Uh, uh, the gorilla approached and you know picked up the child and basically carried it to the zookeeper uh, for safekeeping and uh, remarkable story. Uh, there are stories of other species as well. I mean, there there seems to be some sense of internal uh, moral sense of good and bad. And if if there are some chimpanzees that are very aggressive, others will come. And even if it's the dominant male, others will come and uh, put themselves in between, say, the bullied chimp and the dominant male. Uh, Sounds like some sense of morality there, right? Um, Franz de Waal would argue that there is, and other primatologists would argue that, that there is. But I think there's room for skepticism, or at least a distinction. What you find in, in other primates and also in, in, in other animals is certainly reactions we would reasonably call empathy or anger, uh, often um, that certainly towards kin, certainly to those they interact with. There's nobody who, would, who, doubt, who doubts that uh, a mother chimp will protect uh, her young, um, or will strike out at someone who attacks her young. What a lot of us do doubt, though, is if there's, ever, if there's anything approximating a moral notion um, that would coincide with what we view as fairness or justice. Um, and one way to ask the question is, to what extent do chimps and orangutans and other creatures respond to injustices committed by others, um, where they're third party observers? And there the evidence is very weak. So for instance, there's some, there's some lovely findings that, um, that if, um, if Roy and I are, 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 are uh, chimpanzees together, and you as our trainer uh, <laughs> gives him a delicious grape and gives me a Cheerio, I'm going to get very annoyed. I might throw the Cheerio down in disgust. On the other hand, there's no evidence at all that he's going to get annoyed and right. say, well, this is kind of unfair. I got the grape, and he got the Cheerio. Yeah. Um, <laughs> even though under some, and in fact, when this experiment's done with seven-year-olds, they don't care much either. Um, they care, <laughs> they, but if it's done with adults in our society, uh, and there's clear inequities, in, both in the laboratory and the real world, people respond. I'll, you know, Roy might say, that's not really fair. You're not treating us, us properly. There's no evidence that this comes naturally. Okay, so you, you've said that there is evidence that uh, certain animals, chimpanzees, for instance, may show empathy. Yep. Some of, but, so you're distinguishing between empathy and a sense of morality? I am. I would think that empathy, uh, or you could call it two types of morality, if you want. But empathy is this gut reaction to the pain of others. And it gets transformed into compassion. And I think for animals, too, when you want to help that. But... It's separate from a notion that some things are right and some things are wrong, an abstract, generalizable yes. notion, which is deeply fundamental for humans. It's, it's the foundation for our laws. It's the foundation for large societies. It's the foundation for the objective treatment of those who are not our kin. Um, and I'm perfectly comfortable if you want to call it morality subscript one, following Owen, and morality <laughs> two. Um, I don't want to say this isn't morality. But they're very different. So you're saying morality is mostly a product of reason rather than of emotional response? I'm saying that, that um, yeah, I'm saying that, that, that the morality that's most interesting, that we most want to explain, surprisingly turns out to be the product of reason and rationality, and surprisingly isn't present in other species and in the young of our species. There's an, there's an, interesting, uh, it's an interesting idea. I mean, there's real division among moral philosophers and psychologists, and they're on both sides of this. Um, so there's a, a second century philosopher, uh, Mencius. He, Mencius plays the same role in relation to Confucius as Aristotle is in relation to Plato. And Mencius, in a passage in 2A6, says, any man, if he were to see a child falling in a well, 
will immediately feel alarm and compassion. And so this is a kind of, so notice, it, it, it's seeing a child fall into a well. So his idea is that we're seeded, he calls these sprouts of morality. This maybe would work on the kind of the view that maybe Paul has. So the idea would be there's some native dispositions. Now this one would be easy maybe to explain by evolutionary uh, psychology, right? It's just going to be um, uh, good if we're designed to immediately have reactions to children because usually the ones will be near our close kin. So the question is, can you bootstrap a morality up from a system where mothers and fathers are trying to watch out for their own kin and then build the kind of morality that I think it's true? Our concepts of justice um, are uh, really very, very far from uh, the innate equipment. But it might be that things like virtues of empathy or sympathy are quite natural. And so some people might, you might want to divide different virtues and think some are closer to the nature of the beast and the other ones really require a lot of social construction. Well, Roy, let me ask you. Do you, do you think morality is ultimately more a product of uh, emotion or of reason? <laughs> um, well, that's a question I wasn't expecting. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think the essence of morality has to, be, uh, has to be on the reason side. It's something we can discuss and we can resolve it. We can argue about it. Uh, which is not to say that uh, John Hyde and others aren't correct, that, uh, that moral reactions are often guided by, by emotion and that, uh, in a sense, but we use reason perhaps to educate our, our emotional reactions. Uh, but uh, Well, uh, part, of, part of the reason why I ask this is, Paul, I know you wrote uh, the lead story in the New York Times Magazine on the moral lives of babies and that babies as young as a year old seem to have some... Uh, uh, burgeoning sense of morality, is there reason going on there? I think, um, I, I'm happy to call them sprouts of morality. Um, I, th I think <laughs> the, the, story, the story of human morality, I think, is first what babies start off with, which is extraordinary. But then there's another step. Um, Thomas Jefferson said it was a, a self-evident truth that all men are created equal which is ridiculous. It was self-evident why did it take us so long to come up with it. Um, and it's reason that brings us to that. And, and it's reason that, that, that the idea of, of a large community of people sitting together, who are, many of whom are not related, who had never met before, sitting quietly and listening and respecting rules of work is, is, an, is an accomplishment of reason. You won't find it in the crib. I'm going to take a quick pause here. This is the time when, you, if you have questions, Write down your questions and your note cards, pass them to the ushers who will be circulating, and in a few minutes we will get to these questions. Um, let me introduce another idea here, um, robots. Uh, what would it take to create a robot with a sense of self and with some, some sense of moral accountability? My students, uh, since I came up here today, my students are um, debating this question actually tomorrow. I didn't uh, know we had this question, but uh, this is a, a, a place where, think about Watson, who was in the news last week or last few weeks, right, for beating the two Jeopardy champions, or back to um, Deep Blue, who uh, beat Karpov or Kasparov. Um, one of the things that almost everyone will want to say about those systems, uh, those computer systems, is that there is nothing it is like to be them. Uh, uh, there's no thrill of victory or uh, agony of defeat. Uh, there's no depression. There's no angst. There's no excitement. Uh, there's nobody home. I mean, you might want to think it's, it may be is getting close to what it's like to be a very small infant, although I can't judge that, or what it's like to be at late stage Alzheimer's. Um, but in any case, it's really nobody is there. Uh, and I do think it's interesting that in such systems, we're really not prepared to talk about selfhood, um, uh, even though they do have memory. Notice, I mean, you, it's easy to program computer systems which have complete, as it were, autobiographical memory, but there's something that looks like about them not being conscious which keeps us away from saying that there's any real self and that they're accountable. Yeah, can I add on this? It'd be easier to get a robot to where you'd say it has a self than to get it to know that it has a self. You could get it to be an autonomous functioning entity in a system uh, where it can distinguish between what belongs to it and what belongs to others and has obligations that it fulfills. Get it to do that. Uh, how to make consciousness out of inanimate material, nobody's been able to figure that. So the, the self-awareness will be a much harder problem uh, than to have it, uh, that 
we would say it has itself by, based on all the other uh, uh, qualifications. And I think part of the solution would have to involve the emotions. So I've come forth as a big fan of reason as I am, but I think without the spark of emotion, of feeling, you don't get morality off the ground. It's an insight from Adam Smith and many others. You have to have some degree of caring for it is all to matter. And I don't think you get a notion of self in any interesting sense that we're talking about, unless without some response to pain or pleasure, some goals, some emotions. So, and that's bad news, because nobody has the foggiest idea how to put that into a machine. Yeah. Okay, let me ask, let me put you all on the spot. Will scientists of the future create this robot with some emotional life, a sense of self, and by extension, uh, perhaps the ability for, uh, for moral reasoning? Um, <clears throat> On the one hand, because I'm, you know, what we call, a nat I'm a naturalist. I believe that what there is and all there is is natural stuff. Therefore, we are conscious beings that are made of natural stuff. So you might say, well, then it's it's in principle possible that there could be uh, such beings, uh, and that we're maybe just not smart enough yet or haven't figured it out. But even if you think about, um, it, may, it might have to be so much the right stuff that it would be really making biological beings uh, out of something else. I mean, I, can, I always use this analogy. Um, think about things that are sticky, like uh, scotch paper is sticky, um, uh, and uh, super glue is sticky, and Velcro is sticky. Uh, but you can't make water sticky. You just can't make sticky water. Um, I don't believe that that's possible. So when people talk about, oh, eventually out of silicon and plastic, we can make a conscious uh, being, uh, it could just be like that, that there's no, there's no way to weave the water together. Well, I guess if you make ice, maybe you'd make sticky. But you get the idea. There are some, it's not that any old thing can be made into any old other thing. And uh, it may just be that it, um, it requires biological nature. I, I agree with Owen on both counts. Um, can physical things have um, consciousness and selves and emotions? Absolutely, we are such things. So it's at least in principle possible to create one if only by creating another human. Can you make this sort of thing out of metal or out of silicon? I have, I have no idea, um, and I don't think anyone else does. All I'll add is, here's what I do think we will get very soon if we don't have it already. We will get people who cleverly create machines, robots or computers, that behave in such a way that is irresistible yeah. on the part of other people not to see them as having uh, uh, emotions and selves. Creating a robot dog that is so good at being a robot dog that if you were to, to try to dismantle it by pulling off its head, people would scream, stop. Um, this doesn't mean a robot dog is any smarter or more feeling than my toaster. But they might be able to create one that, that will give you an irresistible impression that it is. And that will be a discovery that will, that will change the world in, in interesting and possibly disturbing ways. But it sounds like that robot dog, I mean, that, that robot dog wouldn't have a sense of self, right? I mean, uh, everyone else might see that's right. that that's right. robot that's right. sort yeah. of as a being, but uh, that's not what we're talking about, we'll right? We'll be able to fake it much, much yep. long before <laughs> doing the real thing. It, it's an interesting exercise, uh, think about free will and, and what sense would it take for a robot for us to say that it has free will in the, in the legal sense in which we ascribe it to other humans. And, and I think that calls it, a, a robot is a creation of humans. It's a tool made by us. It's an extension of our intellect. Whereas free will, it would have to at least be self-programming. It would have to be able to reevaluate its own programming on an ad hoc basis, size up the situation, and then change its, and, and there, you know, once the robot can do that, we might say it's three quarters of the way uh, to that. So I guess I would assume that you think we do, we humans have free will, right? Well, there is something that we have, and certainly we make legal judgments and social judgments, did the person act of his or her own free will? And there is, those are meaningful questions. So yes, in, in that sense. Now, free will has a lot of different meanings, and some of them I find outlandish, and some of them are, are, are very uh, plausible and likely. Uh, if it's just making choices, well, yes, I think we make choices. If it's the mm -hmm. immaterial soul intervening to move it, well, I can't. <laughs> well, Owen, you, you're the philosopher here. Do we have free will? Uh, we make choices and decisions, but we don't have free will. Um, and uh, <laughs> so this is, requires a whiteboard again and some notation. But uh, the basic idea, I think, is this. Uh, and there's, there's, there is pretty much agreement about, among philosophers about this. There's a conception of free will that goes like this, that when I act, I act in a way 
as if I'm a prime mover myself unmoved. I'm sort of quoting a philosopher named Roger Chisholm. So what I do is caused by me, and no one or nothing causes me to do what I do. I think most of us, and I, I, I'm sure my uh, fellow, my colleagues up here believe, um, because the mental sciences study causation, I mean, psychologists, neuroscientists, neurobiologists are always looking about the causes. Just because we don't know the causes that make our preferences or desires what they are doesn't mean that those don't have antecedent causes. So this would start to but make it look as if... not the absence of antecedent no, causes. No, well, this is, the, this is the question about the way free will is defined. Historically, said, yeah. there's a concept of free will which has to do with what I just said, namely that I start causal chains and no one or nothing starts them for me. And that one's not going to uh, work out. That's called the libertarian conception of free will. It's distinguished from political libertarianism. But it's, it's many people think it's the dominant view in the culture, uh, that there's room for a, something which acts... Uh, leverages our lives that itself isn't part of the causal fabric of the universe. And it is tied up with the traditional view of that part of the self, which is a supernatural thing. I mean, there, there's a tension that this conversation is, is, is exhibiting, and it's a tension which many of us struggle with, which is it, it seems if we're only we're stuck with two options, um, neither one of them being very good. One is to accept a traditional free will we do. It's separate from causation. And then you just got to believe in magic. It's not the brain that does yeah. it. It's a magic soul that is itself has weird powers that no one understands. It's just magic and forget about it. That doesn't seem very good. Another alternative is simply to deny bluntly that we make decisions, choices, and so on. We're just robots in a very unpleasant way. That doesn't seem very good either. So what we'd all like to be, I think, is a sort of happy compatible list accepting the reality of the brain and physics, but also saying you make choices and free choices and everything. This is the view everybody wants to have. The problem is there may be a genuine incompatibility with the sort of free will we wish to have and what we know about how the world actually works. Let me circle back to the questions of morality that we were talking about earlier, because I think this, this relates to free will and how we act in the world. Do you see uh, compassion and altruism as something that can be learned? Um, clearly, it can be shaped. Um, I think if a creature had none of that, it's not clear you could instill it somehow. Imagine the, world, the world's worst psychopath who simply has no feeling at all in the pain of others. You could train the psychopath to say, oh, that bothers me and act appropriately. I'm not sure you could train him to feel it. But take the real world case where we all feel compassion to the child in the well. Um, what society does and culture does is it extends and, and, and enhances this uh, compassion. Um, hundreds of years ago, many people did not care at all about the fates of minorities in their culture. Men didn't care at all about women. Nobody cared about non-human animals. Nobody cared about people in faraway lands. Now our compassion extends in all sorts of ways. And we have to credit culture, and I think we have to credit reason. The, um, uh, the many, there are some traditions which do think that all you need for a proper morality is to grow compassion or that sprout of empathy. And I think that is implausible. And one reason I think it's implausible is that, you know, think of a tradition that does that, like Buddhism suggests doing that, and there's, there's never been a successful Buddhist state, never ever. And <laughs> it looks to me like um, there's a, um, uh, the problem is with a sense of justice. And it looks to me as if the sense of justice and political justice is something that people can learn even if they don't have this sort of sense of uh, fairness to start with. Uh, what it gets built on exactly, I'm not sure. But uh, um, so that may be a highly cognitive uh, virtue that we come to realize is um, uh, there's something right about living in a just society. It may not come naturally to us, though. Well, we, we are starting to get some questions from the audience here, and one relates exactly to what we were just talking about. The question is, if morality and empathy are so fundamentally tied to self, do sociopaths lack a self? I would think that under any notion of self, sociopaths have a self. Yeah. They, have a, they have continued feelings. They, have, they can hold a grudge. They can, they can feel pride about something that they did. They, they, they have some, they have some they're, they're not robots. They have some, some sense of self. And this suggests that um, it may be that to be uh, m uh, moral requires a self. But I'm not sure it's the other way around. I'm not sure that a self gives you morality. So what, it, what, what, what is it that sociopaths are missing? What, what's the piece of it there that's lacking? 
Well, there's, there's no consensus on this, but one view is they're lacking certain fundamental emotional responses. As a result, they don't bootstrap their way up into sort of the full moral code we have. They may learn to fake it, to, to try to get around society, to pretend to be upset by the pain of others, but they just don't care. They care about other things. They might care about having sex. They may care about having fun. They may, but they don't care about moral things. So is that, getting back to the question of is morality ultimately rooted in emotion or in reason, is that a, an emotional deficit you're talking about? I think an emotion, yes. I, think an, I, I would say that, I will, again, I'll champion reason, but I think emotion is a necessary part of the, becoming a moral being. It might also be interesting. I mean, there's a ton of research on uh, psychopaths now, and, uh, and some people think they have para, you know, um, compromised, structurally compromised paralimbic systems so that the relationship between the emotion and the reason centers is uh, uh, off. Um, and, uh, but an interesting question that was raised by our, our, the people that introduced us about is about the relationship between a sense of one's own self and a sense of other selves. And this looks like, I mean, I don't know what the psychological research on it show, but it looks as if from the kind of things that, you know, um, psychopaths say, like the, there's the Johns Hopkins professor, I think, who's arrested and they say, you killed the uh, flautist in the Baltimore Symphony, he says, doesn't it sound better? And uh, the, this is a kind of a consistent thing. You think of uh, Anthony Hopkins in uh, Silence of the Lambs. I mean, there's a real, there's an inability to in any way feel the way into the other person. This is a, and it's, it, it's, I think among psychopaths we find, the psychologists find allegedly, that they don't understand the difference between moral and conventional rules. So they don't, they, that is, if, if a teacher says, uh, you, can you wear pajamas to, you can wear pajamas to uh, class, the second grade teacher says that, and you ask the kids, is that okay? They say, sure, that's okay. If you say to the same kids, uh, uh, tomorrow you can give noogies, do they still have noogies? Yeah, whatever. Uh, to the, to the girl, <laughs> I've never been asked that. <laughs> to the girl you like, you know, that's what we used to do. So, and the, most kids say, you can't do that. Even if the teacher says so, you can't do that. Um, and so normal kids start to get this distinction, as I understand it. But psychopathic kids only understand that you shouldn't do certain things because the consequences, the punish, the punitive consequences are really great, but not much because they have to do with the understanding other, other selves. That would be maybe the deficit, one of the deficits, understanding that another self is a human being relevantly like you with a set of emotions, feelings, preferences, and desires. And those, in some sense, are worthy of respect because you get the idea. They uh, start going that way. I'll, I'll just, just jump to say one short thing, which is there was, there's a supporting uh, Owen's argument, there was a heart-rendering interview with a 15-year-old psychopath who would uh, mug blind people because it would just be easier and he couldn't get identified. And he was asked, saying, don't you care about the pain and suffering you've caused this woman? And he said, mystified, he said, why should I? I'm not her. <laughs> and and, yeah. and it, it is hard to reason with such a person. You can't say you, can't say, you, can say you should care, but he didn't. He didn't. Yeah. But in terms of having a self, I mean, Paul's absolutely right, sociopaths have selves. And I think one thing we haven't gotten to yet is that self starts with the body. Each body is a unit. And so the beginnings of self-awareness are recognition of your body. And you know, every living thing draws a line about itself to separate itself from the environment. Uh, I think when you introduced, you said, how does the self learn to relate to the world? But actually, the self starts by dividing itself off from uh, the world. Uh, and so the awareness of that, and that some parts, some sources of stimulation are always here and others not, um, that, is, that is there. And so that sense of self, that, that's a foundation that, that would certainly be there. And then we can go and elaborate it more, and that you have a, a social identity, and uh, again, relationships and all these other things can be added on. Uh, but, but that would be a foundation. Mm -hmm. Let me go to uh, another question from the audience. Uh, aren't the parameters by which we bound our moral behavior also imposed by our culture? And therefore, do different cultures have different senses of self? It's been argued cross-culturally by Nisbet and others that cultures differ in the extent to which they're collective versus individualistic. And a discourse corresponds to some extent with our moral views. Um, John Haidt also makes this argument. So we live right now in, in, in New York City at this time in a very individualistic uh, society, which gives rise to an autonomous notion of morality, where people talk a lot about rights and, and, and what you have a right to do and don't harm other people. Other societies are more collective, 
So their moral notions such as, how do we do, what's, tra what's the tradition? How, what, what would other people think? Does it show proper respect for the group? Um, and this corresponds to, for instance, how important do you take moral values like patriotism? In an autonomous society, you might say, no, we should just all watch ourselves and, and, and focus on, on, on our own uh, uh, rights and privileges. In a more collective society, you say, no, the group matters above and beyond. And it would connect, I think. The extension of yourself connects in that way to moral values. I would say more and more, and I, I agree, um, more and more I think the distinctive purpose of the human brain and mind and all that is to tap in and participate in this new kind of social group that we've created. Uh, culture is a, in a group with systems of doing things and shared information. This is our biological strategy. This is how we solve the problems of survival and reproduction. So we have basic capacities to relate and situate ourselves within that group. And, and so groups may be different. Uh, and so, again, the purpose, you, each child learns the language that is spoken in its environment. It would have been a lot easier if nature could have programmed the language in it, so we were all born with the language there, and we all know this, the words and, and the meanings, and we have to go through this. But uh, instead, you, you learn the languages, and in the same way you learn the morals and the customs and the systems uh, of where you are. So uh, the selves will take different forms, but the, the basic capacity to learn to function as a self within a group of this sort uh, is, is, is what made us human, and that would be common. There's an interesting, uh, this question about, you might call it the question about the natural foundations versus the social construction of morality is a very interesting question. And I've been uh, teaching and doing some research the last few years on, if one goes back to about 2,500 years ago and looks at, for example, the ancient Greek list of virtues, the Confucian list of virtues, and the Buddhist list of virtues, they all have, you know, psychologists write about the magic number seven plus or minus two. They all have about four or five that are the top ones. And it's interesting, they're different. The lists are different. So on the, the Western list, if you say Aristotle, he does have justice. Uh, and uh, you look at the Confucian list, they have this virtue of filial piety. And I'm always struck when I'm in Asia, you can light candles like you can do in Catholic churches, but the candles you put on a shelf for your ancestors. And that just leads to a visual representation, an embodied representation of the way one is connected and has come from those people. And so what we, call, what we sometimes disparagingly call ancestor worship is not such a peculiar queer notion. It's just that I am part of a lineage of persons who I value and respect. And this leads to a lot of elder respect. And on the Buddhist list, you have things like loving kindness and compassion, which are not on Aristotle or the Confucian list. Or even better, on the Buddhist list, you have, uh, um, uh, it's called, I think it's mudita. It's, it's sympathetic joy. It's, actually happiness for others in zero-sum games. That is not a virtue in this part of Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so you might wonder, is this, is, this, is this tapping into, to go back to our earlier discussion, is this tapping into something that Paul's kids in New Haven have that he could bring out? Or is it actually something really that we have to work hard against our nature to inculcate? And if so, that's an interesting thing, right? To try to leverage ourselves so that we do things which don't come naturally to us, be happy for people that uh, beat us at Wimbledon. <laughs> Next question from the audience. Uh, when thinking about autobiographical memory, how does revisionist memory affect the sense of self? Um, well, it serves it as your interests change. Uh, you may revise uh, your autobiography. I think uh, Pat Robertson at one point published an autobiography saying God had told him not to run for political office. And then later on, he ran for president, and there was a new edition of his biography. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I guess the question is, is that just a minor tinkering of revising the narratives we tell about ourselves? Or might there be something more fundamental about changing who we are as, I don't know, new memories or new, new revisionist memories come into play? The past is, you know, supposedly it's fixed and that something objectively happened. But as it lives in our memory, it is, it is reinvented with uh, uh, in light of current goals and current interests. Um, it's actually, we think we remember our lives, but it, it's kind of shocking to the extent uh, that, that, that we don't. And so what we remember at different times, uh, you know, different things will, will come up. If you uh, go through, say, a religious conversion or uh, some other change, you may remember different aspects of your life. Uh, you know, I've heard people tell
felt different versions of the same story uh, at different times and noticed that key details uh, mm -hmm. changed. Um, so, uh, what does yeah, what? Uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, you know, just an ordinary example of this, right? Would be you see someone and you haven't seen them in ten or fifteen years, and last time you saw them, they they were broken hearted over something, and. Now, if you bring it up, they say, I never loved her anyway. I'm like, what's that about? I mean, <laughs> it, it's very common, though. It's, I mean, what do you yeah. psychologists say about that? It's kind of a self-serving spin that you put later, or is it forgetfulness? I mean, it sure seemed like you loved her, and you were devastated. <laughs> well, I'll just say two things. First thing, there are extreme cases of memory, memory failures. I was once at, a, at a, a dinner with my wife, and I was telling this very funny story of something which happened to me. And then she pointed out later that it had happened to her. Um, but but, but I, I, my memory was perfect. It was a wonderful story. And, and, um, and, but, but the issue of, of basically life stories in general is a fascinating topic. Some psychologists argue that each one of us has a sort of narrative we tell. You know, if, if I said, tell me the story of your life, for some of us, it would be redemption. For some of us, it would be striving and success. Others, constantly being betrayed. But, we, but there's a small set of stories that we have, and these stories color everything. If, 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 your, if your story is that of, thriving, of striving and succeeding, you'll blot out your failures in memory. You'll blot Wait, out well, that, that example, to me, raises the question of whether, if you've been married for a long time, do you and your spouse merge selves to some degree? Well, it, it's, it's a question which some philosophers, like uh, Andy Clark and others, have wrestled with concerning the boundaries of self. So a lot of the information I have in my life is in my, my iPhone. Is it part of my memory? Is it different from the memory in, in over here? Um, a lot of the information about movies uh, that my wife has is in here. Um, and she just asks me, and then I come back, well, she holds all the telephone numbers and, and the old information about, yeah. about our relatives. Well, you can and allocate memory. So the boundaries but, uh, get, yeah. there's allocations but of memory. And, the boundaries and, and, remain. I mean, you still know who forgot whose birthday or who took the trash out and things like that. So. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the cells are not, are kept separate, and, uh, um, you know, people are surprisingly attentive to things that matter when you have to keep, keep track of uh, important things within the relationship. But, but I'll, I'll push this a bit further. One of, take, go back to issues of the elderly. One of the worst things that could happen to an elderly person is to be removed from his or her house and put into a new place. Suddenly, the most capable person in the world can become lost and helpless. <laughs> And this is because at a certain age, your memories are triggered by your environment yeah, around yeah. you. Now, I'm not going to get all sort of, I'm not, certainly the person's self is, is, is in their head. But there, I think, is an interesting sense in which the self can then encompass other people and can encompass an environment. Next question from the audience. Why is being moral important for being a self? You explained why self is important for the self, but not the other way around. Why, so the question, why is being moral important for being a self? I, I, I'm not sure it is, actually. Uh, it, uh, I mean, the concepts come apart. I mean, there are yeah. the psychopathic or sociopathic selves. We, we kind of agree they have selves. Uh, and um, so I'm not sure it is. It's just luckily for us, it's typical that members of the species Homo sapiens have the sparks and kind of the gregarious social life that orients us towards some kind of, uh, you know, at least modus vivendi. A lot of people think that living together in communities, I mean, you know, there's, there's these philosophical tales about the state of nature, and Thomas Hobbes, for example, says in chapter 13 of Leviathan, you know, at the, at the beginning, when the ice melted at the end of the Pleistocene, we were all aware in Roy's sense that we were individuals. This is a Western story. And we wanted the stuff. Each and every one of us wanted the stuff in the middle of the room, and we all looked and saw that everyone else wanted it. And we realized that there would be a war of each against each if we acted totally according to our nature. And so the idea is that in a situation of scarcity, that kind of egoism will come out. Then reason makes us shake hands and say, let's not go there. But the, the impulse is always there. And this is, of course, Freud's view in civilization is discontents. That's why we're always discontented, because we can't always get what we want. The Rolling would, Stone said that, too. I would give a different answer. Let me go back to, again, we develop self so that we can be part of this group and part of this uh, cultural group with its systems. I mean, two of the, the earliest concepts, distinctions are between self and others and between good and bad. And so the purpose of what goes on inside, in, you know, as the disparate brain sites create uh, a self as a member of a group, is to be good and seen by others as good. And that can be 
that they feel that you're good, which means they like you. And if they don't like you, if nobody likes you, then you will make changes to yourself to try to get along. And then you want to be respected, which goes in two other forms of being good, seen as competent and as moral. Competent means that you're able to do your job. Again, the culture is a system where people have different, different roles in it, where they have tasks to perform. So you want to be respected for being competent at what you do and being moral or ethical, that you follow the rules, you treat others well, you reciprocate, you keep your promises, uh, and so on. So it, it is one of the basic tasks by which the self secures acceptance in the group and thereby survive, ensures the survival and reproduction of the body to which it's attached, um, is to become accepted morally by the group as a, as a legitimate member and thus be, be, be seen as good. Next question. Do you think it is possible that self-evident truths, in quotes, do exist, but that a majority of people in a given society or time just are not aware of it or don't incorporate it into their legal systems? <laughs> it couldn't be too evident. Right, right. Um, there, there may be, there's all sorts of truths which, which if one, if any creature could think long enough and hard enough, they would come to it. All sorts of mathematical truths could be revealed if only we were smart enough. But they aren't self-evident in the sense that they would come to us normally. They have to be, uh, including moral truths. I mean, the evils of slavery this might seem perfectly obvious to somebody living now, but anybody with, with just a hint of historical knowledge or knowledge of how things go on in other parts of the world realize that our understanding about the evils of slavery is a contingent fact, um, not self-evident in any interesting sense. And, and again, I think it has to be the product of something like reason. And According to Orlando Patterson and some of the others, slavery originated as a substitute for being killed in war. So it was seen as a moral good thing that instead of killing your enemy, you allowed him to enter your, your household and serve you. So at that point, it was seen as a positive thing. Right. Sla slave owners would, were, were, would argue, would say, look, isn't it better to own somebody than to rent them? Because you treat something better if you own it. <laughs> or to kill it, yeah. We're almost out of time, and so I'm going to ask one last question to each of you, sort of put you on the spot here. Given this whole question about the self, the scientific investigation of the self, if there is one question that you are searching for, that you want an answer to about some of these issues that we're talking about, what would it be? Uh, Owen? Uh, boy, that's a tough one. And uh, one question, um, I think I'd be interested in uh, in uh, getting to the bottom of this question, uh, having someone else get to the bottom of this question, about uh, the degree to which um, selfhood is linguistic. I have very powerful intuitions that it, it shouldn't be linguistic because I just have trouble thinking that non-human mammals, at least, uh, don't have a sense of their own life. But there's a very, um, there's a lot of uh, linguists uh, and a lot of philosophers, going back to Descartes, who think that animals just don't have inner lives because they're not fully conscious, and they're not fully conscious because they don't have language. And I think it's a puzzling thing, and I don't know how, um, since I don't, have to, I don't do empirical work, I'd, I'd love to know how someone would sort this out and not just leave us with these powerful intuitions. Um, so, Okay, Paul, your, your big question. Um, my question is, is, is not unrelated. Um, it's, it's when is the notion of self emerge in development, in human development. Not just the date, not just the time of development, but what triggers it? Um, I'm tempted to think that it might just grow naturally. When the brain reaches a certain degree of complexity, a notion of self kicks in and the child sort of, the baby says, as it were, I think, therefore I am. It might also be that that's mistaken. And that's something, maybe language, maybe a certain empathetic relationship with another, something else is needed to trigger that notion. And that, that's what I wish I knew. Roy? For me, the, the, the great puzzle is, uh, again, how is the unity of self created? It's experienced as a unity, it's socially meaningful as a unity, and yet we know the brain is, and, and mind are all these separate little things. And with none of them in charge, how do they compete? All these different parts manage to get themselves together and make a being that can keep its promises and maintain relationships and sort of be the same person uh, over a long period of time. Uh, befitting the requirements of society. I think we have the makings of another panel discussion in the future. I want to thank you very much, Roy Baumeister, Owen Flanagan, and Paul Bloom. And thank you, all of you.